Thank you for staying with us. Our next guest is a co-founder, executive vice president, and chief operating officer of DBH Solutions, a building infrastructure and top-tier technology solutions provider in West Africa, Osaritin Oswald Gubadia. He's a business strategy and technology consultant with over 20 years experience in technology and business strategy and a non-executive director of Renaissance Capital Nigeria. His interests also span venture capitalism, entrepreneurship, mentorship, and funding startups. Hello, Oswald. Hello. Is it's that me you're to... talking about? I wasn't sure again. <laughs> it's good to have you again, and congratulations on the book launch. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Now, um, entrepreneurship is a battle from the office to the streets. I'm sure you know where I got that from. The sentence was an intro in one of um, the short videos introducing your book to the market. Can you explain what that means? Well, as every entrepreneur knows, on a day-to-day -day basis, you are dealing with a number of issues that uh, if looked uh, properly, it's really a battle, right? It's, it's, it's a war um, filled with a bunch of little skirmishes that you have to approach um, tactically and strategically. Um, so you are, you are battling in the office spaces. You're also battling in the street, trying to understand what the market wants, um, try to understand how to encourage and um, push, drive your people to deliver on the results that you're promising the market. So that balance is you have to be versatile. You have to be flexible, right? So you have to understand that the, the effort you have to put in is not just being in the office. You have to have a broad view of going from the office in one minute and the next minute being on the streets trying to solve a problem. Okay, let's talk human capital. In your capacity as a business developer and strategist, um, you've had to work closely with and employ youth. What would you consider the weaknesses and strengths of Nigeria's independent population? Well, I mean, people always throw out these numbers about how, you know, about most of our population under 25, about 60%. Um, I think we need to take a stronger focus on our education system and um, post, you know, basically how we, we, we train people, right? Not everybody has to go to university. We have to look at um, uh, institutions that also train for certain skill sets, technical skill sets, art skill sets, and so forth. Um, we're a very, very talented country. I mean, even with this uh, book launch, which, you know, ultimately... <laughs> We've come to find out that doing a book, writing a book, and developing a book, and putting it all together is actually a startup in itself. And uh, we've also taken a stand, myself and my co-author, Chuka Chukuma, that we we're going to work with all local talent. And what we found is that we're very talented people. I mean, we've gone from, you know, from developing, you know, promos, uh, cartoons, the art direction, um, the little TV shots we've done. A number of things we've done all locally, and we found they're very talented people. Um, where we find gaps sometimes may be in understanding the direction and strategy and being able to communicate that. Once you get the right communication in place, you found that Nigerians are very, very talented. I mean, I'm beyond impressed. Um, some of the material we've, we shared, I mean, I actually had, I had somebody say to me the other day that, you know, they, um, they saw an issue with something we did from a, from a copyright uh, perspective. And the, the, the feedback they gave is, this is Hollywood produced. Uh, you can't make a mistake uh, with, with copyright. And I was like, wait a minute, this wasn't made in Hollywood. This was made in Lagos <laughs> by a guy on the mainland. So we're very talented people and it's very encouraging. Now, taking it from where we left off the other time, as in every other thing, COVID-19 has made it clear how important data is. How do we begin to collect verified data in Nigeria? Where, wo where would you suggest we start from? Well, the data problem in Nigeria is, um, is, somewhat, is somewhat complex because it's a bigger problem, right? So with everything, every kind of problem, you have to start by breaking it down to smaller pieces. Um, I just attended a webinar where um, it had uh, a couple of Nigerian governors, and one of the things they stated is that we don't want to have ID, right? So if you can't identify people, then you can't really track them to follow, um, you know, basically tracing, which is a big part of the COVID-19 uh, process. You know, you test and you trace. Well, you can't trace in a situation where um, you cannot uh, track people and you can't even identify people. 
Um, some of the solutions that, that is being used is through the mobile phone, right? So you have, I had one of the governors mentioned that um, they're looking at data usage on the phone or just basic phone usage as a way to determine uh, a person's uh, ability to sustain themselves throughout through this uh, isolation period. So I think we really need to dimension the problem, um, look at look at uh, data from several avenues, because that's part of the problem in Nigeria. Data is very decentralized. You know, you have some data with uh, voting, you have some data with mobile. It's sort of all over the place. So sort of bringing it together and cross-referencing them to now getting, you know, a unique set of data that we can now use to build on. I've had this conversation with um, a lot of tech enthusiasts and the answer is the same. We, we need to centralize our data, um, have some mm -hmm. form of synergy and all that. But it is not being done. Is, is it that difficult? Is it rocket science? Why are we still where we were? Oh, no, that, that speaks to willpower, right? Um, the will. So you need the will of the government to do that. It is not. It's not difficult. It's not the technology to do this. The brain power to do it are all local, right? We're capable people, and we're capable of doing, you know, managing this data. But it, it has to be. You know, when you look at the number of problems we have, myriad of problems we have, um, it, it starts to seem like uh, data analysis and data data uh, validation and you know data you know data management doesn't seem to be a priority because the there's so many other things. You have health, you have education, you have security, um, you have uh, food security. These things on a on a on a on a, on a on a level on the obvious level um, would take priority um, if you're going to list you know five things you want to address. But anybody who is a project manager would tell you that there are some issues that may not. Um, come up as a top issue, but they are the cross and they are the pathway to solving a number of your top issues. So it's really a case of willpower. If we had the willpower to solve the data problem, we would. The, I mean, it's also a, a problem with approach, right? So if you look at the uh, elections and how we collect data around who can vote, voter registration, you know, that 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 system is, is I don't know if it's still the case, I'm sure in some small um, 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 discrete, discrete um, facility, someone has access to cross data, but it's not being totally utilized in the way you would expect. So I'm sure somebody, you know, maybe a security agency has access to mobile data and can cross it with voting data. But it needs to come down to a level where it's more of a day-to-day -day use where you can actually track people and you can actually effect change or uh, people can be subject to the rules and law due to their um, unique identifier. I like that you said there are tr problems that will probably not be on your number one to ten priority list, but that problem, if solved, would help solve the ones on the priority list. And that is where I think technology falls in. Because we still have these problems in education, in health, and every other sector. At this time, where we are approaching, or we're already in the fourth industrial revolution, I think we need tech to be able to solve our problems. Now, Looking at it from that angle, where do we start from? So, I mean, I've said this a lot of times to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm beating a drum. You really need to break the problem down to very smaller modules, right? So you break the problem down to smaller modules and you put people who are capable of managing that work stream to deliver with very strong KPIs. Um, if you look at technology, for instance, right, you can cross the requirement. I mean, I, I don't know what the top five list is, but maybe technology is not on them. It's not on it. Um, but if you look at the impact of technology on education, especially right now, the people isolated, um, you know, remote learning, you know, devices, um, how do you access uh, people in rural areas from an education perspective? Technology, you know, crosses across. Look at health. You know, they're talking about, you know, remote, seeing your doctor remotely, uh, e-health. That's also technology, right? So it, it cuts across uh, a number of the, of, the, of, the, of the top sections. So you would, you would want to say, uh, you want to say maybe it is critical that we, we take technology, technology and make a work stream out of that and have somebody drive that to ensure that the technology of the country, you know, from a, um, a governmental perspective, um, is, is situated in a way that it can drive several other parastatals, several other uh, issues that we want to deal with in the country. Mm. So in your own assessment, um, what would you say the pandemic has done to Nigeria's economy? And what would you um, 
hope to see going forward? So I would say the economy is definitely impacted by C-19. I mean, as a businessman, there's no businessman that would say that they don't have a C-19 impact. Uh, our projects have stalled. Um, you know, the uh, in, for a period of time when the banks were even closed, cash flow was stalled. You couldn't transfer to pay vendors if you wanted to keep things things going offshore, things that were being produced. Um, but I think also it's given us a different perspective, right? Uh, how we do business. I mean, from a just a life perspective, you, you're getting a better sense of, you know, more so season the day. You have a, a, a sense of that you need to take, you know, take the moments a bit more seriously. And if you take that life lesson and move that into business, um, it gives you a sense of, of, of perspective, as in how do you, um, how do you uh, refocus your business to address the real needs, right? Um, and also, if you look at the evolving world, I mean, there's been, been a lot of research happening recently um, about how the workforce are going to be placed going forward. The way we work is definitely going to change. Um, the, the, the demand on uh, office space may change based on the efficiency and of, the, of the company. Um, the impact of that is now on real estate. Um, so real estate in the sense that you know, the, the, the neighborhoods around uh, Silicon Valley uh, were very expensive, but people are now saying, wait a minute, if I can work from home, then that means I can go live in a different state. So we're going to see a trickle down effect on other, 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 um, other, other industries and other sectors based on, on COVID-19. It's basically going to change our outlook. It's going to change our perspective. It's going to change how we, how we manage going forward. Hmm. I like that you mentioned real estate. Um, and before I let you go, what, how would you rate the impact of work from home on real estate investment? Well, I, I've, I spent some time thinking about that. I mean, and, and I think it's really based on efficiencies of the workforce. Uh, but I suspect there will be a hit to the, to the real estate uh, market to some extent. But I think in an innovate or die type mentality, those spaces will be converted to something else. So they will stay in use. I don't think they're gonna stay fallow. Uh, if you see, for instance, um, we just recently saw a post of uh, parking lots of certain hotels being turned into movie theaters, for instance. So I think there's gonna be some innovation that will happen to reuse those spaces for, for new purpose. All right, thank you so much for your time, Osariti. No problem. Thanks for having me again. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for watching. The conversation does not end here as getting leadership and governance in Nigeria and indeed Africa right post-COVID-19 is imperative. Do join the conversation by following us on socials at Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. Please do stay safe.